I hope you brought your Bibles this morning, and if not, uh, you can look on in the screens, but I want to invite you to find with me 1 Timothy chapter 6, 1 Timothy chapter 6, and verse 6. This morning we're talking about cultivating contentment. I wonder if you're content in your life today. In your daily life, in your personal life, are you content with where you're at? Are you content with your work and with your job? Are you content in your marriage? Are you content with the amount of money you have and the possessions which you own? Most of us, perhaps all of us, come from the womb wanting more. We constantly want more than what we have and things in addition to what we have. I read recently that most people wish they were someone else, doing something else, living somewhere else. I believe that's true. And it's important for us as believers to develop a sense of contentment. Here in America, we are one of the wealthiest nations in the world. Yet many American Christians are driven by the same kinds of spending habits that characterize the culture around us. Excessive consumer debt, excessive spending, uh, continually lie, buying into that lie that we are defined by what we have, our assets, or by our yearly earnings. And we look at these things and we uh, do, 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 compare ourselves with other people. But when we look and compare ourselves with the rest of the world, if you are here today and you make between twenty-five dollars to $30,000, you are richer than the rest, than, you are than the top richest 10% of the world's population. If you make between twenty-five dollars and $30,000 a year, you are in the top 10% of the wealthiest people in the world. But I want you to think about what the Apostle Paul says about contentment. First Timothy chapter 6, and verse 6, he says, Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into a temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows." If you think about what the Apostle Paul says here, he first speaks about the contentment of godliness. And I would encourage you this morning to find contentment in godliness. As you think about what he says, he talks about true godliness. True godliness is accompanied by a contentment. That there is a contented godliness that comes from that relationship that you have with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when he talks about contentment, and I'm going to use that word a lot this morning, that word contentment, in the Greek, it talks about a uh, self-sufficiency, an ability to get by uh, without needing anything further. And as I think about that, I want you to understand that the Apostle Paul redeems that word. He's not saying that Christians are to be self-sufficient. He's talking about a Christ-sufficiency. The ability, once you have Christ, to be able to live without, with Christ and nothing more. Being able to sing as we're just saying, all I have is Christ. And, and, and if I have Christ, I don't need so many other things in life. As we talk about this contentment, it's important that we talk about a Christ contentment, being content in Christ, a, a godliness uh, or a contentment that comes from godliness rather than just simply a, a kind of simplification of life. There is a movement that's become popular in the last several years called minimalism. Anybody familiar with that phrase? Minimalism, it's, it's the idea that we need to kind of purge ourselves of the things that we have and live on less. And we've seen a, a popularity of things like 
tiny homes where people get a garden shed, it seems like, and want to live in that shed. And that, uh, there was a woman by the name of Marie Kondo, a Japanese woman who talked about a lot about minimalism. And I think she has a TV show or something and has written several books. And my wife, several years ago, uh, was, you know, was telling me all about Marie Kondo. And, and this lady would go through and she would just basically clean everything out of a person's home until you were sitting in a stark white room with one chair and one spoon and all these sort of things. And I saw, my wife told me just recently that she read an article that uh, I think Marie Kondo has three children now and says that she's spending less time tidying and more time on family time. I think that's just a cop out because she's realizing how hard it is to be a minimalist. It's, it's hard to get by with, with, with uh, very few things in this world where we're constantly accumulating stuff. But, but I think there's something positive about that movement. It does identify that we need less things than we think. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about this morning is that kind of a minimalism. I'm talking about a contentment that comes from Christ. Uh, I'm talking about godliness with contentment. And you understand that this self-sufficiency, as it's called, is really a savior sufficiency because Paul says in, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And what he's talking about there is the ability to be content if you look at it in its context. And so contentment comes from godliness in our hearts rather than wealth in our hands. Our contentment ought to come from our hearts rather than what we have in our hands. And so you say, think about this contentment that comes from godliness. Understand that godliness creates a profit. In verse 6, it says, now godliness with contentment is great gain. Now great gain means great profit. It is a great benefit. It is a great uh, increase, a profit to be godly. And what is the profit of godliness? It is actually the godliness itself. It is the fact that you have this relationship with God, that you are becoming more and more like God as you grow in that relationship. And that is the great gain he speaks of. In First Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8, he says, For bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. In other words, what he's saying is it is good that we have physical exercise. Physical exercise is good for you. It is good for your body. It is good for your mind. It is, it is one of those things that God has given us, but he says it is of a little profit. Now, that does not mean that it's not important, uh, but you understand that no matter how much you work out, no matter how much you get your body in shape, your body is still going to wear out. If you live long enough, you'll get to the place where exercise becomes increasingly difficult, and ultimately, it will, uh, you will eventually die, regardless of how healthy you are at this point in time. And, the, and the, the opposite of that, though, is godliness. He says that while one has the benefit of the life that we have now, and it's good that you exercise, but godliness is even greater, and our spiritual walk with Christ is even more important because the godliness that we attain in this life, in Christ, you can never lose that. It will pay off in dividends in all of eternity. And so as I think about that, though, he's saying that this godliness that we get now is not only important for eternity, but it's also important now. Not for the, not only the life that now is, but also the life that is to come. And so as he's describing this, we need to remember that the godliness that we have in this life, it is of great profit both now and in the future. You're going to have a better quality of life. Uh, you're going to have greater uh, reward in heaven by doing that. It pays to be godly. And I think for one thing, as we think about the profit of godliness, it allows you to see that God is important and it allows you to prioritize and understand what is important in this life. And, and, and that's largely due to our perspective because godliness, it creates this great profit and, and it changes our perspective. You know, as I think about this, sometimes, and this is going to sound a little strange, but I think that sometimes one of our greatest challenges as Christians, not just as Christians as humans, is that we have unrealistic expectations for life. I cannot tell you how many times I've sat in my office and I've talked to people and they begin to tell me about their life's problems. And, and, I, and I hesitate to say this because I think that they just may believe I have a pessimistic view of life. But I've told people before, you know, I think your problem is that you are expecting too much out of life. Don't, don't you think that sometimes we expect more for our lives than we really should expect? And, and sometimes this lie has been fostered by men who stand in pulpits and hold a Bible in their hand. 
I think about a man by the name of uh, Joel Osteen. And he's written a very popular book called Your Best Life Now. You understand that everything about that is anti-God, anti-Bible. Let me tell you why. Because if your best life is now, the only way you can have your best life now is to, is to die and go to hell. Because if you die and go to hell, your best life is now. But, but if the best is yet to come, if you know Christ, it only gets better and it's not now. And so as I read my Bible, I understand that the Bible is a, an encouraging book, but it also helps me to have realistic expectations about what to expect in life. And the Bible tells me that because of something called sin, that sin has entered the world, and that every person is going to die because of that, and every person is going to have heartache, and every person is going to have some sufferings, and that's what the gospel is all about, to get us through life. And so we need to have the right kind of expectations, and so if we have the right expectations, I believe we'll be more content. Let me just explain to you like this. If I told you that I wanted to send you and your wife or you and your spouse or if you're not married, just I want to send you on a wonderful vacation and I was going to put you in the very best of accommodations, the best hotel room you've ever seen in your life. And let's say that I blindfolded you and I walked you out of one of these doors over here and I walked you across Broadway to the budget motel. Now, let me go ahead and say, this is probably important for me to say, I have never seen a room inside the budget motel. I want to make that clear, but, but, I will, but I will say this, that, that I drive past that place every day, and so I've got a pretty good guess of what a room would look like in the budget motel, and uh, if, if I were to take you over there and I were to open the door and say, voila, you know, and pull off that blindfold and you saw that room, here's what I imagine you would say, this place is a dump. Okay, but let's say I tell you, guess what, you have been found guilty of three counts of armed robbery, and you're going to be spending some time in prison. Let me take you to your prison cell. I put that blindfold on you, and I walked you over there to the budget motel, and I took that blindfold off. You'd look at that room, and you'd say, hey, this place is pretty nice. I got a TV. Man, I got my own room. Hey, look, the shower's even got a curtain around it. You, you understand that when you have the right, when your expectations change, you're, you're going to find the situation you're going to be more content in. And, and I believe that when we have a better perspective of what we can expect out of this life, we understand how this world will treat us, we understand what things we're going to be up against, and we have the right expectations, then we're going to be more content in life because it creates a profit. Godliness creates a profit, and it will change your perspective. Verse 7 says, For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out now think about that a moment when you were born you were born without anything you didn't have a dime to your name you were born without clothes you were born without cash you were born without a car everything that you have including the diaper they put on you was given to you by someone else and as we think about that it's important for us to understand this very principle that we came into this world with nothing and that we're not going to take anything out of it. It's the same thing that Job said, and probably what is the oldest account in the Bible, uh, besides Genesis, but it's the oldest book of the Bible. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return. And so nothing that you have acquired in life since you began your journey in this world will you carry out of it. Stop and think about some of the things that are most important to you. Stop and think about some of your collectibles and some of your valuables. Think about your clothes and your car and your house and your cash. And think about everything that you have. Some of you probably have some things that are very special to you, very significant to you. And let me tell you what's going to happen to all of your stuff when you die. It will be dispersed. Your kids are going to fight over it. Or your grandkids will fight about it. It's going to be dispersed. And it will be, or it'll be sold for probably less than you paid for it, or it'll be thrown away. And a lot of you think, well, at least my stuff will be dispersed to my kids and my grandkids, and it'll probably, once it gets there, it's going to be sold by them. And at some point later in time, it'll be lost or broken, or it'll just cause a family feud. And, and stop and think about that. The things that we think are so valuable are really worth so little. Because it's been said so many times 
but I hate to repeat it, but you've, have you ever seen a hearse with a luggage rack? And the answer is no. There's, we all leave with nothing. Someone once stood by at the funeral of a very wealthy man. They said, how much did he leave behind? And the answer was for him is the same as it is for all of us, everything. The only thing that we can do to prepare for the life beyond and to take something with us is if we have life in Christ and we fulfill the commission and the mission that God has given us through his son Jesus. We have to lay up treasures in heaven. So how do we do that? By sharing the gospel. I can't take anything to heaven with me, but I can take some people to heaven with me if I share the gospel with them about Jesus and they get saved. You know, if I give, I, I can't take any money, but I can give money now so that others can hear the good news about Jesus Christ. And if I really believe that, and if you really believe that, it's going to change your perspective and the way that you give and the way that you live, and you're going to make those sacrifices. Did you know that the average American Christian gives only 2.5% of their earnings to the Lord? 2.5% is the average giving of an American Christian. So if 2.5% is the average, that tells you what a lot of people are giving, zero. People are, aren't giving, and you know why? Because Jesus said, but do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And listen to what he says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Do you want to know where your heart is this morning? Look at your bank statement. Look at your bank statement and see your spending, and that will tell you where your heart is. It'll be that reality check. But the brevity of life and, and, and a healthy theology internalized will change our perspectives. See, godliness creates a profit, and it changes our perspective, but it also calls for few possessions. Notice there in verse 8, he says, and having food and clothing with these, we shall be content. How much stuff does a godly person need to be happy? The answer, less than you think. You don't need, and I don't need as much as I think I need and as much as you think you need. Paul speaks about the basic necessities. He speaks about food and clothing. There are certain things that we do need. We can't deny that uh, when I talk about materialism uh, and we talk about minimalism and all these various things, I, I don't want anybody to get the impression that it is wrong to have things, that, that somehow we could live as people in a material body without material needs. We do need food. We do need clothing. We need shelter. We need relationships and love in life. Those are things that we desperately need. And so we do have needs. But the issue is that we don't need as many things as we want. Our wants are greater than our needs. That's why Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer, uh, that as, pray for our daily bread. And he pointed to the fact in verses 25 to 33 about how God feeds the birds of the air and clothes the lilies of the field. We need to be aware and be careful of trying to get rich. And that's the issue that when we have this perspective that he who dies with the most toys wins if I have enough money in my bank account then somehow that my life is full and has meaning and purpose I heard about a simple Quaker who lived in a house and next door right across the street from him man moved in with a uh, several nice cars and a house full of expensive furnishings and several high-end toys, boats, and campers, and all those kinds of things. And the Quaker went over to meet his new neighbor, and he said, Neighbor, if ever thou to us need anything, come to see me, and I will tell thee how to get along without it. There's a lot of things that we need to probably learn to get along without. It's been pointed out that a man, is his wealth is in proportion to the things that he can afford to do without. There's a lot of things that I like, but how much do we need? 
It's not about how much we'd like to have, but how much do we need to have to find happiness? Luke chapter 3, verse 14, John the Baptist told the soldiers who came to him, he said, be content with your wages. And in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, Paul, or the, uh, the writer of Hebrews says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you know what's significant about that? That in Hebrews 13, he says, be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. One of the things that the, uh, the letter of the Hebrews was written to a group of Jewish Christians in Rome around the time of the mid-60s when Nero was ruling and there was a great deal of persecution. And he'd already said in that letter that some of them had had their property confiscated. And it's pretty difficult to have your property confiscated, but I believe when they heard from this letter, from the author of Hebrews, to say he'll never leave you or forsake you, they could say amen to that because they knew that no matter what they had lost, that they had something more important and lasting in Christ. I heard Adrian Rogers once share a story of when he was a young pastor. He was a small church down in Florida. And one day he described that he and his wife had never had furniture of their own. They had always had hand-me-down furniture. And so they went out and he said they, they bought some brand new furniture. And that very weekend that that furniture was delivered, they got up one morning and found that their 11-month-old baby had died in his crib. And he talked about how after the graveside, he came into the house and he said he looked at that furniture. And he said he really didn't care. If somebody could have lit, lit a match and burned it up, and it really wouldn't have mattered to him. He said, and I, he said, I made a commitment that day. He said that I would never grieve over loss of property again. He said, if God can help me, he said, I'd never try to do that again. He said, because I realized, he said, how meaningless stuff is compared to the important things in life. He said, we need to find contentment and godliness. And it's also important that we factor the cost of pursuing greed. I want you to think about the cost of greed here. Now, now when Paul says those who desire to get rich, uh, th this words, these words do not condemn wealth. They, they don't condemn the wealthy. Uh, they, they don't somehow make having things sinful. Did you know the word luxury? It comes from the word lux. In Latin, the word lux means light. And I, I was reading recently a, a book, and they were talking about in England that, that at one point a king created what he called a luxury tax. You know what that was? It was a tax on light. And so what he started doing is, is he would tax you for how many windows you had in your home. So, so let's imagine if some of you have probably got your tax assessments in the mail. And, and imagine what, if there was an assessor that came by your house and he looked at your house and he counted the windows and he calculated your tax based upon the number of windows you had in your home, a uh, tax on light. One man uh, said that his grandfather had a house in, in, in England at that time and and that his grandfather began to board up windows to lower his tax rate. It, you know, there is a sense in which luxury is kind of this light that comes into our life. And we can have little luxuries in life. Sometimes a little luxury in life is put some light in your life and it brings some enjoyment in life. And I don't think there's anything wrong with enjoying some of the things that God has given you. There are some people who think that it is a capital sin to enjoy life. And I've met a lot of Christians like this. And, and, and they're kind of uh, tight-fisted and they want to make you feel guilty for every good, good thing that you have. Any of you ever met somebody like that? You, you get something new and they say, well, that must be nice. Boy, I tell you, I sure would like to have that kind of money. And, and they start having that attitude, like they're a little bit better than you because they don't have something as nice as you have it. What well, they haven't told you is they might be wearing old torn up clothes and driving an old car, but they're spending it on something else or just sitting on the cash. And we think about there's nothing wrong with that, but when he talks about those who want to get rich, he's talking about the kind of people who 
over-prioritize things. He, he's talking about the man who is so ambitious to have advancements and to make money and get promotions that he neglects his family. He's talking about the gambler who will waste money and who will blow money in order the, for the chance to win something quickly. He'll talk about the person who's never satisfied with what they have. They're from one thing to the next because nothing can bring them enjoyment. He's talking about the person who will sell himself or sell another person in order for money. He's talking about the person who will steal what is not theirs in order to have something. Or maybe the person that we just talked about who's so miserable when everyone else has something that they're filled with envy and jealousy. So you got to understand the person he's talking about with this greed. But notice there, he also in verse 9 talks about the peril of greed. Those who desire to be rich, what happens? They fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and harmful lusts which drown men in destruction and perdition. The peril of greed. Now, what is it that brings temptation? Now, every one of us is tempted by money. Some of you are saying, Pastor, I'm not tempted by money. I'm not saying that you'd be tempted to steal. I'm not be, uh, saying that you'd be tempted to take a bribe. But what I'm saying is that every one of us, uh, that money has some appeal to us. Because in order to have things in life, in order to buy things, we have to have money. And so it, there is a sense in which all people, to some degree, are tempted by money. And if you don't believe me, I believe even cows are tempted by money. You ever been driven by a cow pasture and you see the cow's got his head, or the cow, I guess it's to say she, has got her head stuck through the, the gate. She's, they're trying to, uh, to eat the grass on the other side of the fence. Oh, we can look around and see that most of us struggle with contentment. We want what's not ours. We want to try to reach out. And there is this temptation of that. And, and while temptation itself is not a sin, it's not a sin to be tempted by money, the temptation can quickly lead to sin. Galatians, or excuse me, James chapter 1 says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. And then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Because the peril of greed is not only this temptation, but also the trap. He says that they fall into temptation and a snare. A snare is used to draw an animal away from its path and, and into a place where it doesn't see what's around. It doesn't see the danger. And once it takes the bait, it is trapped and cannot get out. A country singer several years ago who wrote a song called The Hold, and he said, a friend of mine bought himself a sh shovel, said, I'm going to tunnel me a mine. He thought he could be a rich man. Happiness is what he thought he'd find. Got in too deep to see the diamonds, down too dark to see the gold. Now he can't turn loose of a shovel, and he can't dig out of the hole. And there's a lot of people like that. They, they begin to follow uh, their desire for money, and it becomes a trap. They can't get out. They get in over their heads. That speaks about the pull of greed. Those who desire to be rich fall into foolish and harmful lust. That speaks about that pull, the pull on our heart. And it will drown you in sorrow. That word drown or plunge, it's only used one other time in the New Testament. It's used in Luke chapter 5 when it speaks about a boat that begins to sink. And sometimes people are so tempted by greed, by materialism, by money, that it causes this great peril and this great pull and it drowns them. They, they're, they find that they're no longer solvent. They're upside down. They are over their heads, as we say, in debt or despair or depression or discouragement. I see it over and over again. The, time, the story has been told so many times. As we think about it, the problem is that the more that we have, you see this with your children, don't you, and your grandkids, the more that they have, the more that they want. And that's true about us. The more we have, the more we want. It's been said that those who are at sea, you probably remember the old, old rhyme that, that, uh, from the ancient mariner, Water, water everywhere, but not a drop to drink. We think about a person who is lost at sea, floating on a raft, floating on, a, on something that's buoyant in the water. They're, they're there, and the greatest need they have is water. 
and yet they're surrounded by water, yet they cannot drink it. The problem is, is that if they begin to drink the salt water, the salt content is so high that it just makes them get thirstier and thirstier, and it causes the kidneys to shut down and it speeds up the process of death. That's the way greed is. It is perilous. It has a great pull in our life and is greatly perverse. Verse 10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, from which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And think about the source of greed here. He says that the love of money is the root of all evil. He doesn't say that money is the root of all evil. A lot of people have said that. I remember there was a song a few years ago, I think it was 2015, where the man said, uh, they say that uh, money is the root of all evil and you can't get a camel through the eye of a needle. Well, that, that's not what the Bible says. Everybody says money is the root of all evil. No, the Bible never says that the money is the root of all evil. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And you can see that where people will, who love money will do anything to get it. Did you see where the uh, Gulf cartel apologized for killing several Americans? They accidentally killed people that weren't there on their turf. They, they saw this car and they thought there was a case of mistaken identity. They killed a couple of Americans and then they issued an apology. You understand what they were apologizing for, right? They were saying, hey, you know what? We, 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 we didn't mean to kill these people. We would have killed them if they would have been affecting our profits. If they had been here to sell drugs on our turf, we would have gladly killed them. We would have killed them for greed, but we wouldn't have killed them for no reason at all. That's a story that has been told so many times. So many crimes have been committed because of greed. We'll get people to step over the line of their conscience, sever the line of God's word, to steal, to kill, to destroy, all for greed. William Henderson once said that the desire for riches has been the cause of innumerable frauds, dollar sign marriages, divorces, perjuries, robberies, poisonings, murders, and wars. Yes, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And so we see the source of much evil, but it's also the source of separation from God. When he says, uh, which for which some have strayed from the faith, that word in Greek, planeo, is the word that is used to describe stars that wander. We, we think of the word planet. It comes from that word planeo. And the ancients saw all these planets, and the, they saw these lights in the, in the, star, in the starry sky, and they, they realized they were different than stars, which seemed to have a, a fixed course, that these planets seemed to wander among the stars. And in the same way, some have wandered away from the faith. They've made a profession of faith, but the deceitfulness of riches, as Mark chapter 4 says, causes some to fall away. And it becomes a spear of sorrow. He says they've pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Think about the sorrows that come from greed, discontentment, boredom, dissatisfaction, depression, envy. Some of you have some great headaches and some great heartaches because of your greed. Every month, you get that credit card statement. A statement that is greater than you have the funds to pay. And you begin to ask yourself, why do I have this statement? Because you want more than you can afford. Maybe those things that you don't have to have. Some of you may have to have some of those things, but for many people, it's things that they don't have to have. Not only does it create great headache, it creates great heartache, and some, for some it causes them to wander away from the faith they profess. It doesn't mean they are truly saved, but for those who are called away by that, I think we always have to be on guard. If it turns out that you love money more than you love the Lord, it's clear that you've never really truly been saved. If like Judas Iscariot, who kept the treasury, but sold the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Would you sell your soul, sell your Savior for money? It's important that we learn to reject greed and pursue godliness. For some of you, you may need to take a piece of paper today and you need to, to draw a line right down the middle. Begin to write on one side your wants, on the other side your needs. 
And you may have to begin to make some prioritizations and some changes in the way that you spend your money and the way that you pursue and manage your time because you realize that not everything that you want are things that you need to have. I want you to remember what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 4. He says, For I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. That is, I know how to suffer without very much. And he says, I know how to abound. That means I know how to live with a lot. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Let me tell you something. When Paul wrote those words, he was in the Mamertine prison in Rome. He was not getting three square meals a day. If, any, if he got fed, it was because someone brought food into the prison to feed him. He, he wasn't going out to play basketball in the courtyard. He, he was chained in prison, and yet he said, I've learned to be both content. I've learned to be content. I've learned both how to be abased and how to abound. You know what Paul was saying? He says, I have learned to get by with very little, and I've learned in times of plenty how to enjoy it in the Lord. And that's what we need to learn as well as Christians. That whether we have a little, that we can be content in Christ, or whether we have a lot, that we need to give the glory to God. I like what I believe it was King Lemuel said over in Proverbs. He said that, give, give me neither poverty nor riches. He said, give me neither riches that I forget you, God, or poverty that I be tempted to steal and curse God. I believe that's a good balance for all of us. Neither poverty nor riches to learn to be content in Christ in whatever state we're in. And I want you to understand, friend, that if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, that you'll never learn the secret to contentment. Because you know where contentment comes from? It comes from this relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, knowing that he is enough for us. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Jesus paid it all. And he rose again that you can live in him. And friend, today, if you'll give Jesus Christ your sins to forgive and your life to change, he will help you. He will go with you in life. And you can learn the secret of contentment. He can help you to cultivate contentment in your life. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes this time. If there's anyone here today who's never trusted Christ as Savior and Lord, I want you to pray this prayer after me. Dear Jesus... Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And Lord, I recognize that in my life, I've tried to pursue many things. Pleasure, possessions, power, prestige, so many things to try to fill some void in my life. And Lord, many people here today are still haven't found what they're looking for. Lord, if... I, I, Lord, will you help me to find what I'm looking for in you? Lord, I confess I'm a sinner. Forgive me. I trust what you did on the cross was enough. Save me, Lord. And help me to live for you. Help me to be content in you. In Jesus' name, amen.